Welcome to the Inside Track edition of the Digital DJ Tips podcast with me, Phil Moore. Three burning issues in the world of DJing right now discussed in the next 45 minutes or so. We're looking at Bluetooth, do's and don'ts for DJs with new Bluetooth equipment and new Bluetooth features recently launched. What should you be doing? Should you be touching them or not? We're looking at rotary mixers. Are they something that you should be interested in? Where's this whole rotary mixer thing come from? And why has Alpha Theta just launched one that costs the price of a small car? And have cheap DJ controllers had their day? With modern DJ gear full of features that looks like a lot of fun. Are the little cheap plastic boxes a thing of the past? We'll be looking at all of those things in today's show. Remember that this show is recorded in our live student group with real student feedback from Digital DJ Tips students and it is funded by those students. There are no adverts here. It is 100% sponsor free. So let's get going with this edition of Inside Track. So our first topic on this podcast is Bluetooth do's and don'ts for DJs. And this is something that's come about recently because Bluetooth has started to be added to DJ gear, both Bluetooth coming in to the DJ gear, which is probably the more obvious way of using it, but also Bluetooth going out of the DJ gear. So instead of plugging in speakers with a wire, you use Bluetooth to talk to your speakers and get the audio out of your DJ gear, which is a bit of a crazy use as you're going to find out as we continue with this discussion. However, it does exist now. So because this tech has started to come into DJ gear in literally the last few weeks, a lot of DJs are asking, should I be using it? After all, we use Bluetooth all over our lives. We probably don't even realize we're doing it. If you put your AirPods in your ears, you're using Bluetooth. If you press a button on your remote control, well, it might not be Bluetooth for your TV, but it's something similar. And in all kinds of areas, keyboards, trackpads, you know, the mouse on your desktop computer, they're all using Bluetooth or something close to it, right? So as ever, DJing tends to be a little bit behind the rest of the world, as we often say here at the digital DJ tip school. Bluetooth, Bluetooth is just one of those things that, you know, just like streaming services, etc., etc., seems to seems to sneak into DJing 10 years later than everywhere else, but it is arriving now. So we're going to talk now about what uh, Bluetooth can be used for in DJ gear and what's advisable. So I'm going to talk about three areas. I'm going to talk about audio in, audio out, and MIDI over. Bluetooth, which is an intriguing one, and I suspect we'll see more of that. But let's take it from the top then and talk about the most obvious place that you are likely to find Bluetooth on modern DJ gear, which is getting audio in to your DJ gear. So DJ gear normally will take audio from either a laptop, which is connected with a wire, if you're using a DJ controller, or from media players, which again are connected with a wire if you're using, say, CDJs in a DJ booth. But the idea of having something that isn't connected to the DJ equipment is coming of age. You'll find this on, for instance, the Pioneer DJ A9 mixer, which is their flagship mixer in pro DJ booths. That's not the first mixer that had Bluetooth in, by the way. I think that was probably, well, we can go back a long way for, for odd odd mixes that have had this, but certainly recently Reloop have had one or two mixes that have had this. But it's on Pioneer DJ's, in inverted commas, club standard gear, right? So it is there, it is accepted, but also you'll find it on the Alpha Theta Omnis Duo that's just been launched, which actually is quite interesting because one of the downsides which we're going to talk about of having Bluetooth as an input on DJ gear is that you can't really control it, right? So you just press play on whatever it is that you're feeding in and it kind of starts playing up in its own good time and that's kind of it. Well, the Omnis Duo, which is a battery powered modern standalone DJ unit from Alpha Theta, formerly Pioneer DJ, 
has taken it a stage further and it lets you kind of buffer a track into the unit and then you can use the jog wheel and the play and pause buttons even though it's streaming in in the background over Bluetooth. So it's quite clever the way that that works. It gets around one of the downsides of using a Bluetooth input. So it's in there and it's also in engine DJ equipment. So we're talking again, the all-in-one standalone DJ gear that doesn't require you to have a laptop necessarily. From Denon DJ, the prime range of gear there, and also from Numark, the Numark Mix Stream Pro Go has got this. The more modern engine DJ powered gear has got it. So a lot of gear has got this Bluetooth input option. Some of it will have some controls on the unit itself that you can press play and pause, just so you don't have to press it on whatever you're feeding in from, which should normally be your phone. Some of it won't. But the basic idea is you can quickly hook up a music source to your DJ gear, hit play and get some music playing. So why? Why would you do this? Why would you give up control over the jog wheels and the, you know, the effects and all that cool stuff just to quickly play something in from outside? Well, the obvious reason is that you would use this for requests because requests are something that a lot of DJs simply have to play sometimes. Not all DJs, but a lot of DJs. And if it's a make or break situation, imagine you're DJing a wedding and you don't have a track that the, the happy couple really wanted you to play and it's your fault. Well, being able to dial it up on, say, Spotify on your phone and hit Bluetooth link play is a lifesaver. DJs don't like to tell people about this because in the old days, people would come up to you with, your, with their phone and say, can you play this for me? And you'd be like, well, no. And they'd be like, well, why not? You know, just plug it in. And unfortunately you could, <laughs> you know, because all phones had a headphone socket, the bane of DJs lives, at least when the headphone socket was removed from the phone. DJs could say, well, how am I meant to do that? Well, now, hush, hush, it is becoming possible again. However, from your own phone in an emergency, it's a good way of doing it. Also as a backup. So if your main DJ gear goes down and your mixer or your controller or whatever can accept a Bluetooth input, well, you can at least hit play on some music from a phone and get some music playing through there. And also as practice. So here's a time when you might want to do this. You might want to get a loop playing a drum loop playing on your phone, quickly feed it into a mixer and scratch over the top of it. And so use it as an audio source to quickly get some music playing so you can just practice something in the background. I've seen scratch DJs using it for that. So it is useful to have Bluetooth in on DJ gear, undeniably it's useful, but it is fiddly. Even the Alpha Theta Omnis Duo, which has got a, as I said at the beginning, a cool way of adding Bluetooth that lets you buffer a track in in the background. And as soon as you've got a bit of it loaded, you can actually DJ with it. You can scratch with it if you wanted. You can alter its tempo and all the cool stuff that you can do with any track, which is undeniably pretty cool. It takes a bit of getting used to how it works. And it's not as easy, of course, as just dialing a track up and getting it playing any normal way, any other way. However, it's there. So Bluetooth in, audio in to DJ gear, fine, but fiddly. That is our summation of that one. Now let's talk about Bluetooth out. Bluetooth out is everywhere. You wanna to listen to music on your phone, you're using Bluetooth out to get it to your headphones most of the time, right? You want to play music across a beer can speaker, you know, the JBL charge type speakers and the Bose speakers and the kinds of speakers that you might have plugged in at home, but more likely they've got a battery and you're charging them and you're taking them out with you, right? Those kinds of speakers. You're connecting with Bluetooth. Most of them don't even have a line input anymore where you can plug something in. They're expecting you to use Bluetooth. And so audio out everywhere apart from DJing is a thing. It's the thing. However, with DJ gear, it's a no-go and here's why. Well, the first reason why, the, in fact, the only real reason why, is that it introduces latency. And latency is the gap between what you do on the gear and what you hear coming out of the speakers. Now, Bluetooth actually, I think it's up to 5.4 now, the Bluetooth um, protocol. Not many devices use it, but that's the kind of latest one released. I'm pretty sure, five point something. 
Along with some new chip developments, Qualcomm is developing Bluetooth chips with very, very low latency that use the latest version. Along with those, you can actually get pretty much zero latency Bluetooth now. It's just that it isn't built into anything. It's not become common yet. So practically, Bluetooth has got this latency. And latency for DJs is a no-go. You need to hear what you do the second you do it, or at least without any noticeable delay. So a consequence of that is that Bluetooth out is not built in to any DJ gear. If you want a DJ with something that allows you to connect to speakers that don't need a cable, in other words, over Bluetooth, you're either using your iPhone or your iPad with a DJ app and just saying, play, play over my speakers. Of course, your iPhone or iPad or your Android tablet or whatever has got Bluetooth built in as an output, right? So you're either using something like that or you're using, and I keep mentioning it, Alpha Theta's new Omnis Duo, which has got Bluetooth out. Funnily enough, you can only select Bluetooth in or Bluetooth out on that unit for some reason. They have built that in there, and I've got no idea why, because it suffers from exactly the same thing, this latency idea. So latency means that it's a no-go. Even if you can find it and your gear doesn't have it, it's a no-go. Don't try and do it. But here is where it gets even more interesting and even more bad news for DJs. Even if you plug in using a wire from the back of your DJ gear to a speaker which also has Bluetooth and generally that also runs off battery. So again, the beer can type speakers, right? And you know what I mean by the beer can type speakers. They're the ones that are literally the shape of a sideways beer can. Uh, and they normally connect via Bluetooth and they normally charge over USB-C. So they'll work for 20 hours or whatever. Even if you've got one of those where you can plug a wire into it, in other words, it has a line in socket, you're still going to get latency. And let me tell you why. We've done a lot of work on this. The reason is that the modern take on that kind of speaker what the manufacturers have added is this kind of idea of multi-speaker. In other words, if your friend's got one as well, you all press a button and guess what? The music will go everywhere you've got the speakers. Great, you're in the park, you can all be listening to the same music. How cool is that? And how do you think they're talking to each other? They're doing it with Bluetooth. And even if you've only got one of them, even if you haven't linked to someone else's speaker, the digital signal processing circuitry inside those speakers is adding the latency in anyway. So you're not out of the woods. So DJs, you've got to be really careful that you're not getting latency added, even if you're using a wire, if the speakers you're using are potentially able to use Bluetooth and they use a battery. Just bear that in mind. So when it comes to audio out, wire your speakers in and also your headphones, right? So Bluetooth headphones are no good for the same reason. DJ gear does not have Bluetooth connection to headphones. You're still using wires there. Now I'm gonna give you some alternatives to using Bluetooth in a minute, but before we do, let's talk about the third use case, which I actually think is the potentially the most useful one. And that's MIDI over Bluetooth. So think about your DJ controller. Your DJ controller connects to your laptop with a wire, right? Quite often, if it's a small DJ controller, it actually takes the power over that wire from the laptop, but it definitely talks to the laptop over the wire. Ultimately, a DJ controller is just an extension of a laptop. It is a new input output, just like a keyboard is an input output or a, a trackpad or a mouse or whatever. It's just another way of conversing with the software. Everything's happening in the laptop. And so, Traditionally, that's done with a wire. However, there have been instances where it's been done over Bluetooth. Now, before you say, well, hang on a second, Phil, isn't that gonna introduce exactly the same kind of latency? It doesn't actually. And the reason it doesn't is that there's so little information that has to be sent backwards and forwards when you're just taking, you know, is the crossfader moving or has someone pressed the play button, et cetera, et cetera, that it can do it effectively instantly. And I remember the Pioneer DJ DDJ200 controller could talk over MIDI. And MIDI is just the, the protocol that uses, uh, that DJ software uses to, to talk to the controls of your controller. It could talk over MIDI, which, which was sent over Bluetooth to your iPhone or your iPad or your Android tablet. So basically you could have the software running on the tablet and there was no wire linking to the DJ controller. Now there were other short 
shortcomings when you did that, but we won't go into them here. However, MIDI over Bluetooth is a thing. And in the production world, there's a lot more of that goes on. And so I just think we might end up seeing a little bit more of this in DJing as we go forward, because technically there's no reason why not. So just hold that thought. However, let's talk about alternatives to it because you now know that really you shouldn't be using this, certainly for output, but also for input, there are other ways that wireless has been used. So any mobile DJ listening to this show will probably be saying, what about radio microphones? And indeed, radio microphones are a thing, they've existed for a long time. They kind of use the same tech that your phone uses to, to, to communicate with the mast, if you like, the phone mast. It's instantaneous radio. And they are a thing, and they have been for a long, long time. They tend to be digital nowadays. And yes, radio microphones are a thing, so you can certainly use microphones without having to have a cable if you want. Now, you can also use headphones and speakers without having a cable. So there's a company called III, uh, AI, 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 and they have a wireless tech called W+. And Richie Horton actually endorses this for headphones that they make, uh, which don't use Bluetooth, but they do use a wireless protocol that is very low latency. And that means that it works for production and for DJing and so on. You have to plug a little transmitter into the headphones output on your DJ gear, and then the headphones just work with the transmitter. It's kind of like alchemy without any noticeable delay. So if you really want wireless headphones that you can use for DJing, take a look at that. They also have speakers that do it called the Unit 4 speakers. We actually reviewed them recently on Digital DJ Tips. We've reviewed the headphones as well. You'll find all of this in the review section on digitaldjtips.com. And again, same tech, it works really nicely. And actually those Unit 4 speakers are our current favorite DJ speaker. We're really fond of them. But there's also Alpha Theta and a company called Soundbox that have got other systems that they use. Now, Soundbox has licensed a system called SCAR, S-K-A-A, -A, which is similar. You plug a transmitter into the back of your DJ gear and that talks directly to the Soundbox speakers and the speakers can talk to each other as well using the same protocol. So Soundbox are very big battery powered speakers. They look like PA speakers, but they have got all these smarts in them. They've got this, they've also got Bluetooth in them actually, but they've got this um, very low latency communication system in them. And so you might wanna look at those if you DJ outdoors and you don't wanna run wires from your DJ gear to your speakers and then between the speakers, uh, that works really well. And also Alpha Theta have launched a speaker called the Wave 8, which is a similar thing. It uses their own technology that they call Smart Link but it's effectively the same thing. The speakers talk to each other and they give you a little transmitter again to plug into the back of the DJ gear so that it can all communicate. So there is extra tech out there and we've reviewed those speakers as well, those Wave 8 and the, and the Soundbox uh, on digitaldjtips.com. So go take a look if you wanna read up about that. So I hope that's helped you kind of get clear as to where we're at currently with Bluetooth in DJ. This is a live show, as in we're in our student group with students uh, who are chatting about this as we record it. So a few comments that have come in live from Thomas, who says, oh, Thomas just says, thank you for all you've been doing. So thanks, Thomas. Oh no, Thomas also says, the technology is coming. I can feel it. Indeed, the technology is definitely coming. Now, Benny has got an interesting comment. Benny says, my Serato software was acting up. Um, and I went to my phone and I used Bluetooth when I fixed, while I fixed the software. And this is a classic example. Uh, and actually it's a classic thing that went wrong with you, Benny. So I'll share this with the world. Your Serato started playing backwards. Uh, and this is because you've accidentally touched, I think it's the J and H keys, I can't remember. We put a video on YouTube years ago telling you which key will um, will make your make your Serato play backwards and you have to touch it again to make it play forwards again. I've been known to look up my own video on YouTube to solve this problem myself. <laughs> so shows how crazy my head is. Uh, so Andrew says the Opus Quad has Bluetooth in but no Bluetooth out. It actually does have the out, Andrew, but as I said, you have to turn off the in, which is a bit pointless. 
uh, and Benny says, I'm really intrigued by the Bluetooth Omnis Omnis Duo. It's next level. It is indeed next level. I like the way you can import a track. And while the track's importing in the background, you can start to put cue points on it. You can put, um, you can start it playing. You can change its tempo. You can use effects on it and stuff. It's really pretty cool. Uh, and Tom says, what about those Pioneer wireless waterproof speakers? Um, are they Bluetooth as well? Yes. So the Wave 8 speakers are also Bluetooth, but it has Pioneer DJ's technology built in as well. I honestly think, well, Alpha Theta, as they now call themselves, I honestly think that they've confused the world and we'll be, we'll be answering a lot of questions from people who don't understand why they've put Bluetooth output on DJ gear when it's no good. I wish they hadn't done that, to be honest. Benedict, coming in live, says, do you think that there now needs to be a wireless standard that all speakers use that is low latency. I actually think there will be, and I think Bluetooth will be that standard. I just think we're maybe a year or two off that happening. Like, as I said, the, la the latest um, Bluetooth protocol is, is, is basically zero latency or very, very low latency. Right, so we've covered Bluetooth. Our next topic, and remember we cover three burning topics in the world of DJing every month on this, on this show, is what are rotary DJ mixes all about? Rotary DJ mixes are in the news because Alpha Theta, we keep talking about them, but they are the biggest brand in this world, have launched a rotary mixer. Um, it is in front of me now as I record this. It has to go back to them tomorrow. I'm heading off to the mailing room. It's called the Euphonia. And the Alpha Theta Euphonia, named after a bird, and I think the bird is actually called the Euphonia because it has a sweet song. So there you go, these things that you didn't know you didn't know. The Alpha Theta Euphonia is a beautiful looking DJ mix. It's kind of wider than it is deep, wider than it is long. And it's in gold and black and it's got big rotary controls. There isn't a fader in sight. It's two tiered, it's metal. It's got big wooden panels on the side like some piece of esoteric 1970s hi-fi. It's a gorgeous item. And when you turn it on, it has a little screen and the screen is actually one of those old fashioned analog VU meters and it's in sepia tones. It's in this kind of off yellow tone and you get real needles moving up and down, but you look again and they're actually LED needles or LCD display needles. And there's one for every channel. So you could have four going at once. And it is a gorgeous mixer. But you'll be forgiven for looking at this thing and thinking, what the hell is it? I need that, but I've got no idea why I need it. It's so different to any DJ gear I've ever used before. If you've ever looked at like the $2,000 Technics gold turntables, you can imagine it with a couple of those on either side of it and so on. You know you want it, you've got no idea why. And by the way, you probably don't want it, trust me. However, People have been saying in the last week or two, why? Why rotary mixes? And we were there when these things were genuinely a thing. We just, my generation of DJs just overlapped with them. I remember the first mixer I played on when I DJed out in public, one of the first mixers was an old fashioned Formula Sound was the name of was the brand uh, mixer, no crossfader, rotary controls. And I was like, whoa, how do I deal with this? And it was just the norm back then. They were analog mixers. There were no audio interfaces. You couldn't plug your computer into them because computer DJing didn't exist. And so we understand where they came from. And there's been, a, even among people who you would hope had done their homework, there's been people putting out information about what these things are and why you might want to use them that isn't isn't all the story. So I'm going to hopefully fill you in on a bit of the history here and why they are how they are and why you might scratch your head when you're looking at the feature set of these kinds of mixes. So the error that people are making is they're saying, oh, well, rotary mixes sound better. That's why people are going for them. But if you think about it, there's absolutely no reason why a mixer that has got rotary controls instead of slider controls. <laughs> it should sound any better. It's just the shape of the control that does that thing. So yes, they do tend to sound very nice, but not for the reasons you might think. The reason that rotary mixes tend to sound really good is twofold. One, they're analog. And that means that they have got no digital processing and so on going in them. They're very pure sounding. 
In order to make good sounding analog equipment, you need to spend a lot of money. So rotary mixers tend to be analog, expensive, and therefore very purist things. And these don't coincide with mass market, cheap and poor sounding, right? So just like Mac computers tend to be well made, you don't get a cheap $250 Mac, right? You know you're getting a minimum standard of construction. Rotary mixers typically have had a minimum standard of construction, which is higher than the box shifting bargain basement DJ gear, right? So yes, they will probably sound better. The history of rotary mixers is that they used to be the mixers installed in clubs. They just were. So in the Paradise Garage in New York City, in the warehouse in Chicago, Paradise Garage, warehouse. Garage and house music was traditionally mixed on rotary mixes and you can throw disco in as well because these were the mixes that were in the clubs back in the day before cross faders, before up faders. Why? Because radio stations had them and mixes migrated from radio stations into the clubs and they all had these big rotary knobs. That's where it came from. That's the legacy. So they used to be installed and my colleague Steve at Digital DJ Tips remembers when the Ministry of Sound in London first installed its sound system in the late 80s, they installed rotary mixers and they were wired up in the way I'm about to explain to you, which might help you to understand if you were to look at a picture or our review of the new Alpha Theta Euphonia, why that mixer is the way it is and why it's missing certain features. So they, the tradition and legacy is where they came from and they were installed in the, in the iconic clubs where a lot of this music came out of. And before we go to talk a little bit more about the way they're set up and why they have the feature sets that they have, I want to talk to you about who used them and why? So they were used by DJs like classic DJs like Larry Levan, uh, like Kerry Chandler, Masters at Work, Louis Vega, etc. And it was for long, smooth mixing styles. And the kind of mixing styles where you were adding something to the music, the music could be quite drawn out and quite monotonous without its own dips and peaks, without its own uh, its own um, tension and release. So you were adding that with what you were doing on the mixer. So if you look at DJs like Louis Vega and Kerry Chandler, they're working very hard, but the very hard working isn't a new song every 90 minutes and flipping the crossfader across. The, the hard working is the way they're sculpting the overall sound over time. So the, this is one occasion that where you see mixers, uh, DJs constantly playing with knobs, they are actually doing something, right? And so to constantly play with knobs, you need the knobs. So it's a, a certain way of mixing. Now, the other thing that people who don't understand where this came from aren't picking up out there is that a mixer was only part of the DJ equipment that you found in the DJ booth back then. You would also have two other things, and this is crucial. You would have an echo machine, which was based on tape. There were no digital echoes. There was literally a tape running round and the tape echo machine would record the audio and then it would pick it up again later and play it back. So you would get your, your, your delay and your echo by playing back through a tape machine that had a tape running around in it. Now that wasn't built into the mixer, that was a separate machine. So in order to get the audio from the mixer to the tape, you had to send it. It had something called a send. In order to get it back into the mixer, you had to physically wire it in and you had a return. That was called a return. If you look at, say, the new Alpha Theta Euphonia, you'll notice it has send return controls and connections. That's why. So the way you route to and from the effects is through this send return, which is gonna be alien to people who are used to having a filter or a, a sound color control under each channel, right? The type of effects you got were very different as well. They were all based around echoes, delays, reverbs, and Alpha Theta have added in a high pass filter. They haven't even added in a low pass filter. And that's fine if you're used to DJing with this kind of gear. So if you look at that new Euphonia mixer, again, we've covered it. There's a video, there's a, a big write-up over on Digital DJ Tips. Then it becomes clear what they've done. They've built a big mixer that's got the analog mixer looking version, although it is a digital mixer, but that's because they've tried to build something that brings the best of the old and the new. It's got the analog looking rotary four channel mixer. It's got the tape echo section, which again, this is all digital, but it's made to look and feel and the routing internally is done this way. 
And then the third thing that you would find in a Pro DJ booth, which is also built into that mixer, is the isolator. Now, an isolator is something that people scratch their heads and say, oh, I'm not sure what that is. It's very, very simple. It's a three band EQ over the master output. And so when you've mixed together all your different sources and you're sending them off to the PA system, you get an extra set of knobs to cut and boost the bass, the mids and the highs. And that's just as important to this style of mixing as the mixer itself. So now you understand these three parts, the rotary mixer with very little on it, the tape echo, which is separate, and the isolator, which, which traditionally were all separate. They were all 19 inch rack mounted units. Now you understand why rotary mixers are the way they are, and particularly why that new Alpha Theta mixer is the way it is. So they have been particularly careful with that mixer to respect that heritage, even though it's a digital mixer. And also it costs an awful lot of money because they've made sure it sounds really nice as well. So rotary mixes are all about respecting the heritage of how DJing's always been done for certain styles of music, particularly disco and house and garage, and by certain styles of DJ, and by people who want that old fashioned workflow. It's a personal choice, and that's why it's probably not for you. However, if you do want that kind of mixer, I personally think it's great to see the, the choice there because what happened from the time when this is, out, this is what was installed in DJ booths, right? It went out of fashion. Then it was kind of the big Allen and Heath and then the Pioneer mixes with proper faders on, right? That we know nowadays and cross faders and stuff. And the effects were all different. Everything changed with, with digital. So from then it kind of went underground and there were lots of smaller companies, boutique companies making these mixes. And that's kind of where it bubbled away for a while. And just as there's a renewed interest in turntables and vinyl and old ways of doing things, there is a renewed interest among a significant minority of DJs in the old way of using this mixing part of your equipment. And so I think they've jumped on this. And so they're having a moment. And hopefully now you understand a little bit more about what rotary mixes are all about. Thomas in, in the live chat says, we're spoiled, we are indeed spoiled. I think people need to understand DJing is a broad church. So as you know, uh, here at Digital DJ Tips, if you're one of our students, we teach DJing with our five steps, which are gear, the geeky stuff, music, which is your toolkit, mixing, which is what you do with the gear and music, performing, which is when you take it out to the world, and success. And success, the final stage, can be what you want it to be. It can be mixing a single genre with a rotary mixer and turntables. It can be DJing on your phone, using all the tools on the phone to play live streams. It can be being a DJ producer with a hybrid setup. It can be making mixtapes you're sharing with the world on Mixcloud. It can be a full-on mobile DJ setup. These are all utterly different ways of DJing from each other. The music you play, the styles, the equipment you use, the amount of money you spend on it, the amount of time you spend doing it, what you get back for it, could just be a hobby, could be your complete income. So DJing is a broad church, and this is a, a niche within that. So yes, you're right, we are spoiled, and yes, it probably isn't going to be for everyone. Benny says, I would use the Euphonia mixer with my DZ 1200s, which are a very old fashioned way of trying to combine analog and digital from way back in the day. Uh, and these might be an appreciating asset, says Rick. Indeed, a lot of boutique or high end, high fine DJ gear, as you say, doesn't really tend to drop in value. Tom says, uh, it really is a gorgeous mixer. It's like the Opus Quad of mixers. So if you've ever seen the Opus Quad DJ controller and stand standalone unit, it is indeed a gorgeous, it's like a piece of furniture, I agree. It's definitely got a furniture-like ability. Right, so we've covered Bluetooth for DJs, we've covered rotary mixes, and I hope I've cleared something up for you there. For our final topic today, we're gonna go kind of to the other end of the market totally to the other end of the market. And we're gonna talk about simple DJ controllers. So a simple DJ controller is the kind of little plastic box that you plug into your laptop and bang, hey, you're a DJ. Honey, I shrunk the DJ gear kind of stuff. These boxes for the last 10, even 15 years have been the mainstay of many a manufacturer. Newmark, I remember, shifted 
I don't know about millions, but tens of thousands of their little, uh, what were they called? Were they called them? They weren't called the mix track. What were they? What were they called? The mix of something. I honestly can't remember now what they were called. Tiny little boxes that one of you will remind me, I'm sure, before the end of the show. Uh, but one of their little, um, little, little um, plastic boxes that felt lightweight, didn't have an awful lot going on with flashing lights and so on. But you plugged it into your DJ software and you had all the controls of DJing. You had the two things that spin round. You had the cross fader. You had your up and down faders. You had your EQs and your volume faders and so on. So these boxes utterly transformed DJing. They were the, they were the growth area that this website and school grew out of back in 2010, 2011. Because suddenly you didn't need thousands and thousands in order to get started in DJing. You could literally use the laptop you already owned and plug in one of these units for $150, $200. And you could do more than anyone on CDJs because really the software had a lot more functionality than those, or um, than anyone had ever seen before anywhere, because the software was literally leading the way. Every week, it seemed, there were new features in the software. And because all the work and all the features and all the expense, if you like, was the software running on, the clever software running on expensive hardware, i.e. your laptop, the box itself, had nothing in it. It was just a few controls. Thank you very much to RV Mielo on our live chat, who reminds me they were called mixed track controllers, weren't they? So long since I've played with one. And so, yeah, there's a good example there of, uh, do they still matter? Uh, is, is this kind of controller dead? Um, so yeah, they were very cheap boxes, but they could do so much for your extremely small outlay. And they obviously had a lot of advantages. They were small, they were light. You could suddenly DJ in tiny venues that couldn't fit normal DJ gear. You could take it on holiday with you. You could DJ anywhere. Utterly transformed the world of DJing. They turned it from a spectator sport into a participatory sport. You know, we could all do it all of a sudden. Wonderful times. Um, and the small, simple DJ controller ushered these times in. But things are changing. And we can ask the question now, do they matter anymore? And so in order to answer this question, I think we need to look at a little bit more in detail what actually happened in the past, say, 10, 15 years. And so I've already alluded to the fact that DJ software with these tiny boxes could do more than CDJs. CDJs being the pro gear that you found in DJ booths from 15, 20 years ago onwards. Now the original CDJs were definitely digital. In other words, you suddenly didn't need to buy music. You could rip the music yourself, put it on CD yourself and play it in these units. Then you could put the actual MP3s on the CD, not the audio, and play it in the units. So you could fit far more on there. And then you could put a USB drive that you'd prepared on your laptop in the units. So now you weren't even needing to burn CDs. So you can see that the CDJ world was drifting towards digital as we know it now. But at the same time, they were starting to get more features. You were starting to get the ability to loop music. You were starting to get the ability for the CDJs to figure out the BPM of the music it was playing. So the looping was getting a little bit more intelligent. And you were also starting to get things like cue buttons. So you could have cue points on your music and you could have saved loops on your music. So you're drifting towards all this stuff that was in software but they were still pretty poor feature-wise compared to software. Software was full of effects and analysis and beat gridding and samplers and key shifting and all this stuff which you could not get on CDs and software had awesome search functions so you could have your whole collection with you and stuff. So you had these DJs with very cheap boxes and laptops on one side doing all this stuff that CDJ DJs could only dream of. And in fact, most of them didn't even know it was happening. I remember when we first worked with Layback Luke, he's like, what, you can do all this stuff on software? Who didn't, why didn't someone tell me? You know, so you had these two worlds, the pro world lumbering away with this equipment that was pretty old fashioned, pretty limiting. And then you had the amateur world with all this amazing stuff. But what's happened in the meantime is those two worlds have converged. So the big CDJ systems, they're not even able to play CDs anymore. They're now totally digital. 
you can network everything together in such a setup and with one cable plugged into your laptop, the whole thing becomes a flight deck style super DJ controller that can do everything. It's awesome to play on. And so they've converged on what laptops can do. And the only real thing that that kind of setup can not do now that laptops can is the real time acapellas, instrumentals and drums and so on. Laptops have got push buttons where you can instantly get the acapella and all that stuff. You can't quite do that on this gear yet. You will be able to soon, mark my words. So there's always gonna be a lag, a feature lag, but basically they're starting to get music streaming services built in, cloud libraries built in, all the stuff that marks software out as more capable. It's all kind of merging together now. So at the same time, laptop controllers have got more and more sophisticated over time. They were only small cheap boxes at the beginning. I remember when I first started reviewing them, I was trying to DJ in clubs on them and they were horrible. I ended up just using the, 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 the laptop keyboard with a really good quality sound card because I could map everything and, and the controllers were that bad. But they've got better and better and better. You look at modern DJ controllers and the thing about the, the pro ones is that they're not just DJ controllers anymore. At the very least, when you're spending good money on them, they've got motorized platters, they've got external inputs, so they're really like a standalone DJ mixer. They've got professional outputs, professional microphone inputs. Quite often they can uh, do pretty much a big chunk of the stuff that the, the, the Pro DJ gear can do, quite apart from the software. And then, of course, we've got the pretty rapid rise at the moment of the all-in-one DJ unit. Now it's all-in-one for two reasons. Reason number one, it's got the decks and the mixer all in one box, but it's in other, in all other ways, just like the Pro DJ gear with separate items, a separate mixer and separate media players. In other words, you don't need a laptop. They've just put it all in one box, but ultimately you plug your USB drive in that's got your music on and it all comes to life and you can just DJ in exactly the same way you can on Pro Gear, right? So it's all in one in that respect that they've taken the separate parts and put them into one box. But it's also all in one in that this gear can nearly always nowadays plug into your laptop and you can use it in myriad ways with a laptop. So you can use it as a DJ controller. You can literally control DJ software from it. It becomes a big glorified controller. But also you can treat your laptop as a hard drive. And so you can use it in the same way you would use Pro DJ gear with a USB drive, but you don't need to export your music to a USB drive and plug it in and go through that kind of, sometimes it's a little bit boring to do that. Just plug your laptop in and it, and it treats your laptop like a big hard drive. So all this tech and all these worlds are converging into the modern do-it-all DJ box. And someone mentioned the Alpha Theta or Pioneer DJ Opus Quad, that's a good version. Uh, the Denon DJ Prime 4 Plus is the equivalent version in that other big ecosystem for this kind of thing. And this is really what any self-respecting DJ who's taken their hobby or their profession seriously is probably gonna want to get one of these units rather than a little DJ controller because they can do everything in one box and that's highly, highly appealing. So rather than go and buy the kind of units that if you add it, added it all up would cost you the same amount as a small car, which is ultimately the stuff you find in nightclubs, all the separate stuff, or rather than buy a DJ controller that can just control laptop software, for a little bit more money nowadays, you can buy a really versatile unit. Everything's in one box for sure, but it's a DJ mixer. It can access the internet. It can work with a, with a wire attached to your laptop, either as a hard drive, just accepting the laptop's music or controlling the DJ software, or it can work on its own. So one of these units is, is kind of what you should be aiming at. Now here at Digital DJ Tips, we teach DJs that one of these types of units should be their second purchase. Now, if you're coming to this hobby and you've got a lot of money to throw at it and you just want to jump the first step, then great, go and buy a Prime 4 Plus or an Opus Quad or Pioneer DJ, XDJ, XZ or whatever. That's fine. 
That would be the unit that we would say buy, keep, use for the next five, 10 years. But everyone else, guess what we recommend they do? It's go and buy one of these simple DJ controllers. So I think simple DJ controllers still have an awfully important part to play in the DJ world. No, you're probably gonna outgrow it and you're not gonna to wanna to keep it as your, as your main DJ unit if you take this hobby seriously. You can do better, but they're cheap. They've got all the features you need to learn, all the features, and then some. They are absolutely perfect as a first purchase to learn on because they're flexible as well. You can play with the best of these very cheap units on different types of software. You can even play using your phone or your iPad instead of a laptop as a effectively as your computer. And they're easy to sell. So if you decide DJing is not for you, hey, we won't hold it against you. You can sell it and not lose too much money on it. But hopefully you decide DJing is for you and you keep it and it becomes your second DJ unit. Because any self-respecting DJ needs a backup unit. You need something that you can whip out should your unit fail you, your main DJ gear fail you, or if you have to send your DJ gear off for repair and you want to carry on DJing at home for fun, hey, you've got something you can take out of the cupboard then as well. And so what we tell our students is buy yourself a cheap DJ controller. And then they say, well, which one should I get? And honestly, between you and me, it doesn't matter. We would always recommend the Pioneer DJ Flex 4, FLX 4, just because it works with pretty much all software platforms and because you can use it with uh, iPhones and iPads and Android as well as with your laptop. But honestly, you can do the basics of DJing on any of these units. Just don't fret about it. They're not very expensive anyway. Get what, get what you can find, learn on that. You can always sell it afterwards and buy something else without losing too much money. So the really interesting thing here is that people often ask us, why isn't there a range of DJ gear between the very cheap DJ controllers and the pro gear that you're talking about, Phil, and I don't mean the pro gear you find in pro DJ booths, but the big all-in-one systems that will cost you four figures. And I think the reason for that is that the logical leap is from a cheap DJ controller to a really good all-in-one or a really pro DJ controller. In between, the bets are off as to which features to leave out on which features to add in. So some of them have only got two channels instead of four. Some of them have not, uh, have got bigger jog wheels and stuff, but they've got awful inputs and outputs. So you can't really do much else with them. There's always a compromise too many. And it's like, it doesn't seem to make sense at the mid price area to go for something that's halfway between a beginner controller and a pro controller. It just makes sense to make that leap. We always say from three figures to four figures. I think that's probably why it, it works that way. So yes, simple DJ controllers still matter because they are the perfect thing to learn on and they are the perfect backup system to your pro controller, which should be, or your pro all-in-one, which should be your aim eventually in this hobby. So what do you have to say about this? A lot of you saying that you have not got rid of your first controllers and a lot of you name checking, Andrew, Trevor, all name checking the, the, the Newmark dj to go These are tiny little units, but they're great, I agree. Uh, I use it for a backup in emergencies, says Trevor. Andrew says it's cheap and cheerful and I love it. Uh, so uh, agreed, agreed. Uh, Rick says I use the Reloop Ready. Again, this is a really nice little controller. It was actually designed by DJ Angelo, who's one of our tutors. And he designed the Reloop Ready, which by the way, is a really tiny controller. It's like, you can put it, if you open a laptop, you can put it on the keyboard and it will sit there without being bigger than the keyboard of the laptop. It's that small. And Angelo designed it because he wanted a DJ controller that had all the features, but that was really tiny. And so, you know, sometimes you want to buy a small phone, but it's, it's very underpowered. And then Apple made the, 
the, the small version, the, the, the iPhone mini, uh, and it wasn't underpowered, and, and the people who wanted that kind of phone loved them for it. Well, the really Ready is a bit like that. It's got all the features, but it's tiny, and Angelo designed it because he needs to prepare his DJ sets in hotel rooms and stuff, and he needs a controller he can carry around with him, and so he designed it exactly for that. And Rick says, I have one, and I love it for less formal events. Uh, the only drawback is it has no standard microphone input, so I have to kind of find a way around that. So thank you uh, for sharing that. Uh, Lou says, have you ever seen those glass topped controllers? Will they ever take off? They didn't take off. They were, these were controllers. It looked like a flat screen TV, but put horizontally. And you could kind of have your laptop software showing on there as a massive touch screen. They were absolutely horrible to use and they didn't really take off at all. I mean, they look good for sure, but we want physical controls for sure. So that's where we're going to leave it for today. Thank you to our amazing student community for joining the live recording, for helping me pick the topics in the first place and for all the questions, discussion points and comments that enrich our shows. If you would like to have your question on the show to take part in these shows, then it's open to anyone who is a digital DJ tips course owner. And as one of the leading DJ schools out there, we've got an awful lot of courses to choose from. So head to digitaldjtips.com slash courses and have a look at the range. The next DJ course for you could be right there. I have another favor to ask you. Please do head to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star rating and review. It doesn't really matter what you say. It's those five stars that are important to us. Meanwhile, get good, get out there, make the moments, and I hope you'll come back again very soon. Till next time, bye-bye.